Hi, I'm Yegi. I'm an entrepreneur and success coach who wants it all. Family, luxury, career, and the freedom to do whatever I want, whenever I want. And I'll do whatever it takes to get there. I created the Yegi Project to document my journey and inspire others to do the same. My mission is to change the world by influencing and leading others to do what they love and live fulfilled lives. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the Yegi Project. Today's honored guest is Richard Parker, who is a small business acquisition expert. He has over three decades of experience transforming businesses and inspiring other people to actually transform their lives by his program called How to Buy a Good Business at a Great Price price. He has over 100,000 copies sold across 80 countries. So he's really making a global impact. And I'm so honored to interview him today and pick his brain about business acquisition, an area that I am not an expert in. But he has also been featured in Forbes, New York Times, and has over 300 published articles. To further showcase his authority, Richard has acquired 14 of his own companies throughout the years. Now, Richard, welcome, and please tell our listeners, in your own words, who are you and what do you do? Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me. It's good to be here with you. So I've been in the uh, world on the on the business side. I've been in the world of business acquisitions for over 30 years, as you mentioned, buying and selling my own companies and helping others do the same things. I got into it quite by accident. I was working for a company and I made a real dumb investment in the stock market and blew almost all of my money when I was 29 <laughs> years old. Yeah, I mean, It's easy to laugh about it now, of course. Um, and so I had about $90,000 at that point. I blew $60,000 buying stock on margin. It was just really dumb. But at the time, it was really dumb. In hindsight, it was terrific um, because that really caused me to rethink where I was going with my life at that point. My first child, I have four kids and a grandson, but my first child was on the way. And I realized that there was no way I was going to get out of this hole working for someone else. I was already in a job that I was overpaid. And so when looking at my options, there were very few, which the one to, that would put me in a position where I wouldn't have a limit on my upside was to get into my own business and quickly realized that buying one versus starting one made a whole lot more sense. I actually started one temporarily and within three, four months made an acquisition of something similar and uh, the journey began and here we are 20 something years, well, 30 something years later and uh, 14 <laughs> businesses and along the way I started helping people do the same thing through the course that you'd mentioned, um, which has really been incredibly gratifying because we've helped a, just an incredible number of people across the globe you know, realize their dreams of business ownership. Awesome, awesome. Okay, I have a few questions just off of that. But um, my first question to you is you mentioned your mistake that you made, and that's kind of how it got you into where you want to be. I'm a big believer of everything happens for a reason, and it leads us to a direction we need to be. But at the time, I know it was devastating, right? I like to ask the question is what has been your biggest challenge? And what did you do to overcome it? Would you say that was your biggest challenge back then? Or have you had another big challenge in your business? business world or life that you really had to push through to overcome? I wish that was the only <laughs> challenge that I had to overcome. Um, it, it, and I don't, don't really perceive it as, as a, that as a challenge. It was, it, was, it was clearly a blessing. And at that point, I, I didn't have any options. So when you don't have any options, it's very easy to make decisions. And unless you, you either get paralyzed or you move forward. So in that particular instance, actually, I look at it as a blessing and not really a challenge. I just, here's what I had to, I had to resolve something and get it done and I had to move, I had to move quickly. I think challenge wise though, something that would be much more meaningful would be, I was a young business owner, I was 29 years old. And for me at that point, you know, my ego and my insecurity always got in the way. Um, I was always dealing with people that were a little older, more educated than I was, uh, oftentimes more successful. Um, and so I had, the, you know, my own ego and again, insecurity dealing in that world of business ownership, being a very young owner. It's changed a little bit more. People can get into side hustles and other businesses today. It's a little, the world's a little different. But getting over that, you know, and that was really um, an incredible hurdle once, um, once I got over that and recognizing that, once I started to engage and hire people that were bigger, better, faster than me, didn't feel threatened, and realizing that, um, you know, uh, it, 
being right is not important at all. It's getting it right and doing the right thing. And once I was able to get past that, I mean, my whole universe changed. So it was a wow. challenge as I look back at it. When I was immersed in it, I didn't think it was that crazy. But when you, you look back and realize that was really, you know, it was really prohibitive. Yeah, more of a mentality shift. Um, yes. All right. So you mentioned acquiring a business versus starting a business. And you mentioned that you did start one and quickly realized it's much harder to do that than acquire one. Now, in today's world, I talk to and work with a lot of entrepreneurs. And a common idea is I want to start my own business, not that I want to buy a business, I would like, I would say. Now, can you talk a little bit about that from your experience? And what are the pros and cons of both? Okay, so I think from a standpoint, I understand the, the tendency to believe that you should start a business. And if someone is working full time and wants to do it more as a side hustle or something on a smaller scale, I get that. That's a good path for people to go on because at least it gets you into the world of entrepreneurship and you want to start that. You want to start getting down that road as soon as possible. However, you know, between starting a business and buying a business, when you start a business, it, everything sounds wonderful because you haven't done anything yet. But you're starting everything from the beginning. You don't have any customers. You don't. Everything is a plan. Everything is a dream. Everything is a hope. Whereas when you buy an existing business, all the things that you're concerned about with a startup, which is how am I going to get customers? How am I going to get employees? How am I, how am I going to build a sell sales? Those are all solved for because when you buy an existing business, you have customers, you have employees, you have revenues, you have infrastructure, you have processes, you have procedures. So everything <laughs> is in place. You're starting from a rock solid foundation. And, and the idea, what I've been teaching people for years is when you do this the right way I believe in buying a good business not a great business you want to buy a good business so it has some room for for growth and making sure you're the right person to buy it but when you do it right you get the keys to the place on Monday you'll be able to take a paycheck on Friday with a startup the failure rate is enormous in the first five years and so when you buy an existing business you've already gone past that startup phase mm. and and the, the heartburn and and that that the owner typically has, they've already dealt with it. You're, you're, you're <laughs> buying it when they're already past that. So at, you know, for, uh, there's no question. It's much more advantageous to buy something existing. You hit the ground running. Now, of course, I'm sure the key is buying the right business. You said a good business at a great price. That's your program. And I'll ask you more detailed questions about that. But, um, you know, it sounds easy to you when you talk about it, because this is what you've done for decades, <laughs> right? But to me, it's like, okay, but there is also so many risks, because I need to consider so much. And um, one main thing you said, you need the right business for you, of the, the buyer. Can you talk a little bit more about that? How do you know what is the right business and if you're the right person for that business well it's a great question because if you were to hone in on one thing that you have to do flawlessly during the whole process of buying a business it's that it's identifying what is the right business for you because if there's there could be a good business that you're looking to acquire but if you're not the right person to run it then it quickly becomes a garbage business. Mm. So that, you know, there's 23 steps in the business buying process. If you do an average job on 22, but you do a flawless job on identifying the right business, oh, wow. by and large, you're going to be okay. But if you do the opposite, you do a great job on all the other 22 steps, but you screw up and make sure you buy, and you buy the wrong business for you, you're going to go out of business. So I'm glad you brought that up early because that's everything. And it's a process of elimination because what people think they're good at or what people think they, or what they enjoy doing doesn't necessarily mean that's their greatest skill set. And mm. of, oftentimes people confuse expertise, right, with experience. Experience is industries that you've worked in, but expertise is what you did specifically. What's your one shining skill above all others, whether it's sales, marketing, operations, putting a team together, putting a plan together, managing people, whether it's manufacturing know-how. And you do that through a process of elimination, which is you go, first of all, you, could, you should speak to colleagues, friends, bosses, and employees or uh, associates that you've worked at, at to help them guide you what they think is your best skill. But the best way to go about doing it is to go out and meet with business owners whose businesses are for sale and find out what do they do every day. Oh, that's and, a great strategy. I wouldn't even think to do that. Yeah, and, that's, and, and you do it through a process of elimination. So you pick out a few categories of businesses. Maybe it's commercial landscaping or durable medical equipment distributors, whatever it may be, and, and meet with sellers of businesses for sale. What do you do every day? My, the mantra that I've been telling people is whatever it is that you do best, 
has to be has to be the single most important driving factor of the revenues and profits of any business you consider purchasing because for everything else you can outsource or hire so again i'm glad you brought that up because that is th that's everything i mean that's it really is that's well, the key can you mentioned that last thing again what what were the two things what were the what, two things that you have to do whatever it is that you do best has okay. to be the single most important driving factor of the revenues and profits of any Got business it. you consider purchasing. So whatever is actually uh, like the key thing that's making the money for that business, that skill set, you want to make sure you have that if you're buying that business. And Correct. that's how you clarify with the owner of the business that's selling it, if that's what they do. And that's if that's what they do. You. Correct. You know, for me, I have five golden rules when I buy a business. It's got to be sales and marketing driven because that's what I do best. I want a business that has an element of exclusivity. I want a business that doesn't compete on price. I want a business with high margins. And I want a business that um, where there's demand in place for the product. And I know with those combination of five, which I've cultivated over years and teach people how to do that for themselves, when you match that with your top skill being at number one, you'll wind up getting into a business where your skill set matches and you can you and you can grow the business accordingly. Okay, and now the elephant in the room for my <laughs> audience. I know they're going to want to know this and I want to know this. For somebody who wants to acquire their first business, they're not wealthy rich. They don't have a lot of money. About how much do they need to budget or put aside or save up to in order to kind of be like, okay, I have enough money to start looking to buy my first business. My first business I bought with $30,000, which is today's equivalent to about 75000 Now, one thing that is important is, yes, people, you need some money to, to buy a business. There's no question. And all these things that you hear online of buying these great businesses, making hundreds of thousands of dollars for no money down, no out of pocket, no risk, close bullshit. the deals in 30 days. <laughs> Call bullshit, 100% bullshit. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it makes my blood boil. I deal with this all the time and tell people, look, you, you, you're just going down the wrong road. It's not reality. You're smoking crack and, and it's nothing but a scam. You, leverage is very important. Leverage is more important than looking at it as far as risk is concerned because you can solve for the risk most of the time. But leverage, 91% of our clients buy their businesses with seller financing. They don't buy it with no money down. There's money down, the ratios vary. In the United States, they have the SBA loan program, which you can leverage at about 90 to 10%. So you can leverage about 90% of the deal. So that's a wonderful program. But the individual and the business has to um, um, qualify and some people there's collateralization that's required and some people aren't comfortable with that risk so you want to go down the road of seller financing and the vast majority of businesses sold in the lower market include seller financing for exactly the reason you brought up which is most people don't have a lot of money or can't get financing you can't go into a bank and get a regular loan unless you put up a hundred percent collateral i mean i can because i've done it 14 <laughs> times but at the yeah, beginning the you can't time around it's really tough i personally had to get a sba loan yes. and and put my house on the line and exactly they got it all worked out you it know, all worked out you, you know you have to know what you're doing. A you little. have to know, right. No, no, a lot. You have to know what you're doing, but what you, the way you went about it and it worked out because you, you, you went in there with knowledge, you were well-informed. You didn't, you might've made some mistakes, but you didn't make any big mistakes. You did it methodically. So even that SBA, the SBA plan, which is a fantastic plan if you're comfortable with doing that. And realistically, if you investigate the business properly and you match up your right skill set, well, the risk is mitigated exponentially and you have to get comfortable with risk if you're going to be an entrepreneur nothing of is risk-free i mean if you want if you want a risk-free uh, professional life just be an employee yeah there, there's always the going right to be an element you will not be a good entrepreneur if you can't take risks and go with it and just really roll with the consequences of sometimes failing <laughs> correct it happens and you know if you to get back to your earlier point how much money do you need businesses at the lower market are trade at a multiple and so a multiple of a business usually two real lower market, let's call it two to three times. A business making $150,000, $200,000 will sell on the upside um, for $600,000. Then you wanna be able to get this, in, a, in an SBA scenario, you can put down $60,000. 
and you, or you, the seller can finance 10%, and that could be your down payment. Or you do a combination of SBA and seller financing. So how common is seller financing? I personally haven't looked into that too much, so I'm curious. How common is the seller financing? Because we're talking about small businesses, right? So for small businesses, I mean, just logically for me, if let's say I were to sell my business, I don't know if I necessarily would want to finance unless who I'm financing to is like really guaranteed, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? And for somebody who has no idea of how that works, if they're the seller or the buyer, how does the seller financing work? So the first thing people should understand on the sell side is the majority of small business transactions include seller financing because that's the only way to get a deal done. There's very few people that are walking in and stroking a check for cash to buy a business. And even if they have the cash, they'd be a fool to, they'd be a fool to write a check for cash. They want to have some leverage because the only way to really validate what the sale is, what the seller has represented to you about the business is to have them with skin in the game as well. Oh, wow. I see. So that's really important. Plus the fact that most people can't get a loan and most businesses won't qualify for finance. So a seller, if you want to sell your business and this, at the lower end, you're going to have to finance part of the transaction. I and see. I agree with you. You know, you're concerned about the buyer, so you, you want to establish a nice, meaningful relationship with them and see their skill set and learn to like and trust them or dislike and distrust them. And then you wouldn't want to finance them. The assets of the business are used as collateral. They sign, individuals will sign a personal guarantee but they don't pledge personal collateral, unlike what you do at a bank. The assets of the business are the collateral. And so that's what satisfies the seller's security. Now, I you see. wanna have the right individual because you don't want the business back. Of course, so, and we go back, yeah, we go back to that first biggest, most important step that you mentioned, find the right business for you. <laughs> yes, oh, absolutely. And that's and obviously gonna be the right business owner. That's gonna be the right business owner. And through, you know, when we, you know, when you, if you're looking to buy a business and you start engaging with someone who owns a business, you want to have a meaningful relationship with them. It's not just about the numbers. It's not just about asking them the 36 key questions that you need to ask them and, and going through it like, you know, at, at 100 miles an hour. You want to establish a rapport with them. Make sure that that's a good relationship because... First of all, you will need them to train you anyways, but in a good relationship, they'll be able to divulge information to you that other, they wouldn't necessarily do otherwise. So that relationship works two ways because the seller wants to establish that as well if they're going to finance you. So that's on the sell side. On the buy side, the percentages vary anywhere from, you know, um, it could be, you know, 80% to 30%. The average is probably between 30 and 50% that a seller finances and a buyer puts down in the lower end of the market. That's some good basic parameters. But understanding that seller financing is absolutely a requisite to get the deal to the finish line. Well, I think that's gold, even for my listeners who don't have any experience in this area, but they do want to dip their toes in. This is gold. Even for me personally, I've never acquired another business. I've always done my business and grow it and keep growing it that way but now that i think about it i'm like hmm if i have some extra money this sounds like a great fun project you know you're an entrepreneur you're an experiment so thank you so much i think it's really gold of just even knowing that okay i don't need two hundred thousand dollars upfront cash in order to acquire a business we can we do have other financing options and i think it's not talked about as much outside of the really um entrepreneurs who do acquire businesses or advise people like yourself so thank you so much for sharing so much information on the podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right. So now I um, beef, I just jumped into the questions because I love this topic, obviously. <laughs> Me too. Um, it's what but, I do every day. Yes. <laughs> but I do want to get to know you um, personally a little bit. I love asking some random questions to my uh, guests. So the first one will be is if you were a fruit or vegetable, what would you be and why? You can if take I was if I was um, a fruit about <laughs> or vegetable, oh my goodness. Well, I definitely wouldn't be a vegetable because I'm a sweet, I like sweets. And so I would have to say, um, I'd have to, I'd probably say an apple. Apple. Okay. Why? I think the apple has a con, not, not because of Apple computer, but you know, the <laughs> apple has a connotation of like, I think about the teacher, you know, um, with, you know, it, 
you, as a kid, there was always this um, graphic of bringing a, an apple to the teacher every day. Pet they student. They did a great but marketing, they, these it, apple it, farms. It, the apple farm. Oh, yeah, they did unbelievable. <laughs> so I think, like, I associate that more with learning, and I'm always on a quest to learn oh, as I much as that. I can. You know, I'm always, like, I love, I love learning new things. Um, I really love learning new things and, or, and about new things and new businesses and, you know, and, and on the personal side as well. So I think an apple, I just, I, to me, it conjugates oh, with that. learning. So I think that's where we'd go. But again, and it would have to be sweet. I couldn't do the vegetable because <laughs> I we had a... I'm going to steal your answer. If anybody asks me what mine would be, it's going to be an apple for that same exact No problem. Thing. You could steal it all. No, no problem. You don't, you don't have to give me any credit. Go ahead and steal it. I'm glad it makes sense for you. <laughs> all right, Richard. Next question is, um, what is one thing more... Most people don't know about you. Well, on the personal side, everybody knows every, everything about me because I've like, I have no secrets. But I think on the business side, I'm not sure. I think people are, are are surprised to find out. I never went to college. Oh, okay. So I think people are sort of surprised. I went to a version of community college in Canada, which was two years, which is really an extension of high school. So I never went to university, and. Um, people are always, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm proud of it. It's certainly not something I'm not, 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 or something I'm ashamed of, but I think people are surprised thinking, well, you bought all these businesses and you did, you know, X, Y, and Z, and you must've had an MBA from UPenn or Harvard or whatever, nothing like that. I mean, as a matter, and I'm, and I'm glad I don't because I, I deal with those individuals all day who have those fancy degrees and they, and the biggest problem, the biggest challenge I have is understand, explaining to them that your education has nothing to do with knowledge. It's completely different. So I think <laughs> people are surprised, true. you know, thinking that this buying businesses is so sophisticated and requires a high level of education and it's not, it's very doable. So I think that's the one thing about me people would be surprised to learn the other thing actually as i was talking was you know i'm a very energetic guy i'm getting older but i've still got lots of energy and i think people are very surprised to learn that every day one o'clock no matter what i meditate good good do yeah. you just do it during the day one meditation or you do morning and evening as well I do one a day. I try to do two, and I know t I follow TM, and it's prescribed to do two. And they say that in the morning it's great to do it as soon as you get up. But I'm ready to rock and roll when I get up in the morning, <laughs> and I'm too hyper. Good but in the you. middle of the day, yeah, in the morning, like, but at one o'clock, and the odd time I have a meeting or I can't do it, I, I make sure I do it before or after. But I stop my day, no matter what I'm doing, um, at one o'clock and do my 23 minutes. I, for me, it takes 23 minutes, and it's really uh, it, that's been a game changer. So people awesome. are surprised when they know me. Say like, I go at 100 miles an hour, and I'm always energetic, and <laughs> then the then the brakes go on. Nice, hey, it's your siesta. <laughs> my siesta. Awesome. Now, my, I actually had a follow up question to that, but I forgot what it was. It'll come back to me. But um, if you can change one thing with a magic wand, the first thing that comes to mind, what would it be? Change one thing in the world. Yes. Eliminate social media. Ooh, okay. Why? I, I think people have just stopped talking to each other. I mean, I don't want to get too philosophical, but yeah. I, mean, I, I think like human relationships have really taken a hit. And the it ability has. for people to engage and have a good back and forth and be, you know, um, you know, my late partner and I, in business, we used to always talk about, and he was speaking to his dad recently, we were talking about, he said, we used to have beautiful disagreements. You know, like it was... And I find that you just can't, that really seems to be dissipating this ability for people to resolve things face to face, to not just, you know, there's the whole entitlement thing, but I'm just talking about the engagement, the interaction between human beings to resolve issues. I'm very much of the proponent, even in my businesses, if you have an issue with a, a seller or a, an employee or whatever, you sit down, you're brutally honest, not insulting, always be respectful, be empathetic. But I find that social media has just like completely eliminated that personal engagement and I just find it toxic I mean I just yeah, I just I you know that's that. so I would yeah so yeah I mean that would be the that one thing, if I, thing okay uh, well I think we can definitely benefit from that but for me the reality of it is <laughs> probably not going to happen because a lot of businesses also benefit from it but you know but, also, relationship <laughs> <with> <laughs> but, but you know business was done prior to social media what what it has allowed you know smaller businesses and individuals who potentially couldn't get into business or I, and I admire that. I think it's fantastic. And people access to information and to an audience that you normally could never access prior to that. I just think it's just gone way off the reservation yes, as far as the relationship. Yeah. I'm, I'm just a relationship guy. I mean, yeah, I like, I love that. 
You know, I, I, love, love, I love engaging with people and have an idea and we go back and forth and no one's ever insulted if you say something and I'm never insulted. I mean, I love being wrong. I wasn't always that way, but you learn, you learn a lot more. So that would be the one thing. And I know uh, pe some people would say like, there's no way I'm getting off of Facebook or Instagram no, or whatever. But, but relationships are so important psychologically too. I've talked to a lot of um, psychologists and relationships are key to happiness because I'm big on happiness too. So the podcast focuses on entrepreneurship to have a happy be live right, right. Yes. so it's, it's huge anyway so let me go back to the happy question not go back but this is a question <laughs> i love it could be a deep question if you've thought about it it could be easy or you can take a minute to think about it but what does a happy and fulfilled life look like to you today like if it was your ideal life and you can have it that way and did it differ 10 years ago or 20 years ago I'll answer part B first. Yes, it definitely differed 20 years ago. Um, I th and that makes sense really more from age-wise, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm in my early 60s now. So I think when you're in your 30s, 40s, etc., sometimes even earlier, you have this quest for, you know, for money and material things and, and, and making your mark on the world and, and, and progressing in, in your professional career. And you're also mixed with potentially with families um, and, and young families. So I think you're what life looks like sometimes at that point with everything that's going on, what a happy life looks like. I just want to sit on the couch for an hour and relax, you know, so, you know, it's, your perception I, I, is different. I feel that with a lot of tiny kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it, it, it's understandable. I have four kids and one grandson, so I, I, I get that, that period of time when you're juggling a lot of things and trying to make a career and you have a spouse or a partner and they're trying to do the same thing and kids and everybody has their moments. So I think at that point in time, you're really trying to forge their way. So happiness at that point looks like, well, if I had more money or, or something um, along those lines. But, you know, as you get older and you, you acquire some of those things or don't, um, I think for me, happy life is just being for me is being able to do what I want to do when I want to do it with the people I want to do it with. Oh, that's perfectly said. Awesome. Awesome. One last question about you um, before we jump into some more specific uh, career questions. Um, if we were to follow you around for a day as an entrepreneur, your typical day, I know it probably varies a lot since most entrepreneurs have a very flexible schedule, <laughs> hopefully. Um, what does a typical day look like to you? Do you have a morning routine, night routine? We already know you meditate at one o'clock, but besides that, what key, what structures your day to be successful? I'm, I'm up, I, um, I'm ready to roll. I uh, bang down a couple of espressos. I do my, uh, I do my stretches because I used to have a terrible back problem. Do my stretches. I have a few minutes with uh, solitude and my prayers. And when I get into my day, I will, um, I used to get, I start right off and start reading some news and I don't do that anymore because it's just like, it starts off too negative. Not happy. It's <laughs> not, not happy. happy. It's like not happy. So I stay, I, I, I stay away from that. Um, but I'll answer um, emails or I, I generally have calls most of the day with um, individuals looking to acquire business. I provide them some consulting along the way or people that I'm representing that are selling their businesses. So a good part of my day is spent on the phone with individuals, both sides of the, both sides of the equation and answering emails. I take my meditation. I, um, I try to close down early enough, um, but it depends. I mean, we do a lot of webinars, so I think my day is focus mostly on buyers, um, helping them throughout the day, whether it be by email or calls. And whenever I have an opportunity to go out and meet with individuals, I do that as well. Um, I don't have a set time for when I start my day. I go to bed at night when I'm tired and I wake up when I'm awake. Um, as it turns out, it's usually pretty early and sometimes late, but, um, and then, it, and then um, my, so, you know, past the work date, it's, um, we try every night to have, um, my wife and I have dinner together and my 22 year old son's still at home. So we do that. And, uh, and I'm a hockey fanatic. So I'll watch a couple of hockey games, read and rinse and repeat. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So let's dive into more, some more specific questions. So yep. I was checking out your website. I noticed you have a free webinar on due diligence, or you also have a program about due diligence, or that's what it's called. Can you tell our audience a little bit of what that is and three key takeaways from that webinar if they're not to if they're if they haven't heard it yet okay perfect so the webinars we do live and we do them every couple of weeks on the subject of everything related to the various steps in the business buying process due diligence is quite comprehensive so a couple of takeaways 
from that. The first thing is people need to understand that due diligence goes way beyond the financials. The numbers are the numbers. Numbers don't lie. People lie. It's math. They work for the number. They, you know, it's simple. I don't know. It's easy for you to say that, but in today's world, I feel like, I don't know why there is this belief in me. Uh, I, it's probably wrong. I hope it's wrong, but there's this belief that I can't even trust numbers. Like people are trying to manipulate or like play around <laughs> with numbers and I can't trust them. Now, um, but that's a good know. observation because skepticism, you want, to be, uh, you want to be skeptical as a business buyer. It might be one of the best attributes that you have. But the beauty, you, you, you are right, except you can solve for that easily because the numbers are or they aren't. You can get to the bottom of the numbers. They have to add up. One on one always equals two. If they have on their, price, on their profit and loss statement that here's, the revenue, here's what the revenues are, they have to have the backup. If they don't have the backup, then it's, again, it's math. It doesn't make sense. So I have to provide the backup. You have to backup. know what to look for. You have to know what to look for. And it's not overwhelming. The nice thing about the numbers is I teach people how to read financial statements. You want to do, be able to have comfort with that. But the financial piece of the due diligence you're hiring an accountant because that's what they do every day and so they're looking for a paper trail they're validating the numbers so the biggest part individuals tend they make a biggest big mistake by focusing way too much on the numbers and and the truth is mm -hmm. the numbers are the numbers they don't they don't lie they could have some uh, variation to them as you pointed out but they they one and one always has to equal two you could come to the bottom of it you can come you to the bottom of it, it yes correctly. there's no mistaking it where you other points that people want to consider is the preparation is very important. You only have a limited time to do the formal due diligence once you submit an offer. It could be 30 days or what have you. So as soon as a business is of interest to you, before you even make an offer, you have to start your due diligence. You have to start investigating the industry, the market, the competition, um, the sales and marketing of this company, metrics that you can find from other businesses for sale. Because what your goal is during due diligence, you know, we have a commandment. It says you pay for the past, you think about the present, and you buy the business for the future. So huh. when you pay for the past, those are the numbers and the valuation. And you think of where is this business now considering the present. You buy it for the future because you want to know what is life going to look like after I take over. Am I the right person? Is the industry strong? Are there opportunities for growth? Are there any threats related to competition or suppliers? So all that parts of pieces of the due diligence you have to start very early on because if not, you're not going to have enough time to do it. So the third piece, and again, we have a 200 point due diligence checklist, but the third piece that's really important is your organization. You have to be meticulous. If you're not organized, better become organized because there's a lot to do in a short period of time. It is all doable if you go into it understanding here's what has to be done. Here's the people that are going to be doing it, whether it's me, whether it's the attorney, whether it's an accountant or someone else and making sure you manage that project because if you... The goal during due diligence is to uncover every potential problem before you buy the business. And if you don't do a thorough job, you're going to come to the end of your period and say, you know what? I just don't feel comfortable enough. There's too much that's, that I haven't investigated. So you're either going to make a dumb mistake or you're just going to abort the project and potentially miss a, a golden opportunity. So those are three high level things on, you know, our webinars, we do them every couple of weeks. We cover a whole wide range of project, uh, of, of parts and projects and parts to the, um, business buying process and so I encourage people to join and we don't charge for the webinars i mean we're happy to have people in, and we and, can and, link all of that below yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's a, but they're glad you brought it up because due diligence is of course is a really important piece of the process all right i'm very curious at 12 what business did you own and <laughs> <laughs> tell us the story oh it is a great story i grew up in montreal and there used to be a newspaper, the Sunday Express. You only could pick it up at this local store. It wasn't delivered. My father used to send me out Sunday mornings to go pick up the paper for him. And let me tell you, if you've been to Montreal, it, going out to the, to the store in the middle of February, it, you freeze your ass off. And so <laughs> no, didn't want to do you. it. No, thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. So, but it always, like at 12, I was saying, I can understand. Like the, all the, the other two newspapers in Montreal, which didn't come on Sunday, they used to deliver them to the house. I also had those routes when I was later on. So I, I went to the Sunday Express. I called the Sunday Express head office. I was 12 years old. They said, how come you're not delivering to um, the local residents? You have to go to the store to buy it. And I said, I'll t I, want I said, give me the chance to buy a bunch of papers from you at a discount and I'll deliver them and collect. And so they agreed to let me do it. And I started 
I'm soliciting people in the neighborhood to get a subscription to the Sunday Express. It sold for 15 cents. <laughs> and, and I got a, a road. All of a sudden, I had built it up to like 100 people. And I bought them from them for... Um, the paper used to sell for 15 cents. They agreed that they would pay me two cents per paper. Hmm. That, wow. And, but the beauty was we sold for 15 cents, so people used to give you a quarter, so you got a dime. So you made 12 cents a piece because the tip, they used to give you a tip. <laughs> then, the, then the problem was I started getting more and more of these, and it, the road was, I had to carry it around on my bike. It was like ridiculous <laughs> how heavy it was, a 12-year-old kid running around, carrying like two massive bags and then four, then I had to go back to my house and, get, and load up again. And so I started selling off pieces of getting other kids in the neighborhood to deliver some of the papers. And then what happened is the Sunday Express, the price went up from, from 15 cents to 20 cents. And I said, oh, shit, I'm not working for a nickel anymore. <laughs> so I sold off all the routes, except I kept 100 for myself. I sold off all the routes and I told all the neighborhood kids that you'll take this, you get these 100, you get these 50, you get these 100. You can keep all the tips. I was still getting the two cents from the Sunday Express head office. I You're wasn't getting distributing. You I was distributing. Start. And I was making like, you know, you think about this. This was like in 1973. I was making like $20 That's a very week. Impressive, I mean, yeah. my, allowance, my allowance was 50 cents a week and now I'm making 20 bucks a week. It was like, you know, like I was the big man in town. <laughs> I always had money in my pocket. College, what? You didn't need college. <laughs> Who needs college? Yeah, I'm making 20 bucks a week. <laughs> no, but I do believe in education though. I'm, I'm big on education. I love education. I mean, you said you love education too. You love learning, but yes. maybe not the very um, ideal routes for college and all of that. But yeah, yeah. I, I'm huge on education. I think everybody should try to go to school and college, at least start there. You you do pick up good skills, maybe not necessarily only um, like the degree you're going to earn, but at least like not procrastinating, having deadlines. I don't know. I, I'm, yeah, working I'm hard. Yep. Yep. Um, okay, my next question to you is: You've acquired a lot of businesses. You've held a lot of. Uh, you've helped a lot of people acquire or look into it. What are? Uh, what is one business or just a story that you have that went wrong? And what did you or your buyer or seller learn from it? Do you have a story or something? Oh yeah, I got plenty of them. And for myself personally, I had uh, found a company when I was living in Canada and found the company, they were in the um, metalworks business, making decorative wrought iron for higher end homes. Um, they, they did spectacular work. They did some work actually for my family, but they put um, uh, decorative bars on, on the basement windows because we were having a lot of robberies in the neighborhood. And um, when I went to see this guy's shop, I was just very curious. Um, and it was, it was spectacular work. They were doing some big work for nice homes, hotels, that type of thing, but beautiful wrought iron work. And it was a tiny little shop north of the uh, city of Montreal where I was. And I remember thinking that, you know, the, this was, these were guys that were all blue collar workers, welders and what have you, but they weren't doing anything as far as actively selling the product. And I spoke to the owner and no, it was none of that. The orders would come in. They would just make the product, sell it and what have you. And I figured this is a terrific opportunity because if they're not doing any sales and marketing, I mean, that, that's the way you could boost the business and ended up acquiring that business. And very shortly thereafter, I realized they made a terrible mistake. The sales and marketing weren't what drove the business. It was the caliber of the work and the quality of the work and individuals mm. and des designers, architects, contractors would come in and they had a vision in mind and the people could sit down who worked there and design the product specifically for that project. And I was, you know, the, the individuals that were doing the welding, these were, you know, tough blue collar guys. And mm. we got along fine, but we had nothing in common. And my world where I operated from a sales, marketing and promotion, it was, it was like, it made no sense to them. And they didn't want necessarily more work. It wasn't a matter of going out and selling. It, the, the, what drove the revenue and profits of that business was the, no, the manufacturing know-how. And I completely miscalculated. I ended up getting rid of the business. It was terrible. I made a, it was a horrible mistake. But it was, you know, ultimately. Great learning experience. Yeah, exactly. Ultimately, you know, it reminded me and made sure of how important it is to match the right skill set, your right skill set to a business. I mean, that was, you know, ultimately a lifelong, phenomenally profitable lesson. Um, um, costly at the time, but profitable in the long run. All right. So last few questions. What is your favorite and your least favorite part of your job? My favorite and my least favorite. 
I would say my favorite is certainly engaging with prospective business buyers. I mean, I love that. People who, you know, have a hope and dream to change their life, but no plan, no knowledge. And I I love the guidance part of it. Um, And I get unbelievable gratification from helping them get to the finish line in a good way. I, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really wonderful because you really, you, 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 and that's why you're good at what you do because you love it. (laughs) Yeah. I love it. You change, you've, you've changed someone's life. And so the helping piece of it is, it provides enormous gratification. The part about my business that I don't like, and again, I also represent some sellers, um, but the part of the business that I don't, don't like is I don't like the marketing piece. Even though I'm good at marketing, I mean, it's one of my strengths, the whole internet marketing thing, I don't like to have to try to convince people, and I don't. I mean, I'm, thank God I've, made, you know, I've done very well financially. I don't do this for the money. If I never sell another course, it doesn't change my life. But it, it, it boggles my mind with all of the noise that's out there of these people that are selling programs for thousands and thousands of dollars that are very misleading. They're not going to help people buy businesses. I find them to be scam artists. They're, they're self-anointed gurus. It really pisses me off. And so, but I, and they have no track record to prove it. No track record. They're just great at marketing. Most of them haven't even done what they're selling materials to do. And so I find that, you know, the part I don't like about my job is, is anything. I don't want to have to try to convince people to, use this material like I figure yeah. if you can't get to that conclusion on your own given the track record like you know so that part of it exactly. like I just want to educate I just want to educate people and get to your own conclusion so the marketing piece is not something that I love especially with the social media there's there's just too Same. much too much bullshit and people like you could be whoever you want and and that's not a good thing same it's frustrating honestly that's one thing i tell because i coach some people on general business too and that's what i say i say look at the person who's coaching you what have they done are they just doing this just to talk and they've read it out of a book they're just telling you or they've done (laughs) actually done it they've They've started a business they've made x amount of money like ask to see their financials (laughs) oh absolutely you know i've gone you know i've had this conversation with people when i did work with the uh, dalio family office they had some great terminology if you think they always had this thing i used to say hire the number one draft pick but they used to their term used to be you know only engage with believable parties you know real believable parties Awesome. So you said Dalio. So um, actually, I'm a huge fan of Ray Dalio. And I recently I've picked up this book like Principles? a year ago. No, Changing World. The Change the Order. Yeah, I have it here. He sent it to me uh, when the first came out signed. Yes. So, so I'm dying to finish reading it. I started a year ago. Then I had another baby. <laughs> so I just kind of stayed on the back burner. So th- it's so funny because I was um, looking at your portfolio and literally I was like, oh, I'm going to ask him about this. So you've actually coached his son, correct? Can yes. you share that story? And I mean, that's huge because he's like a king in the investment world, right? So um, you must have something that he picked you to do this. So can you tell me, share a little bit about that experience and how did, um, how, how did you get that job offer? Okay, they actually hired me twice, once in 2007. Um, I got a call. Hey, from that's, even, from- that's, even, <laughs> that's even better, you know, once they can maybe give you a try, but you had to have done a great job for them to hire you again. <laughs> yeah, so, so once early on, I got a call from this individual. He said his name was Ray Dalio. It meant nothing to me at that point in time. His son was down. His son, Devin, was living in Florida and he was looking to acquire a business. And he had got my name through a, a third party and wanted to hire me to uh, mentor his son at that point to teach him how to buy businesses. My son at that point had just been diagnosed with epilepsy. And so I, want, I was in planning to take three months off to learn about that condition and disease. And so I told him, look, I'm, I'm not taking on any clients at that point. He was very kind. And I didn't know who this guy was. He said, you know, he had some good connections and in the uh, healthcare community. And if there's anything he could help me with, he's happy <laughs> to put me in touch with people. I said, well, that was very kind. And I felt really, you know, I was, I was so um, uh, honored that he'd be willing to do that. I said, well, at the very least, let me meet your son. And I didn't meet with him. And I thought his son was, a, his name was Devin, was a terrific kid. And I ended up taking on that project. And I worked with, um, for a few hours every week, I, the, my curriculum, my course was the basis of our learning. So we would go through a chapter, do some homework. Then we start looking at some businesses. And ultimately, they were just starting out their family business. We, Devin and I worked together for like a six or seven months. And only during once during that time did he mention something 
off uh, ab about the family that somehow thought I stumbled and said, well, you know, I think they might be from a pretty wealthy family because I, I don't give a shit about that stuff. And I sort of Googled them or looked and I was like, oh my God, this like guy's worth like $10 billion or something. But it didn't change the way I was working with them or anything, but they were just starting their family office, which only had a couple of people at that point. And it was a good decision to, for Devin to go and work for the family office and get, you know, a good learning experience. And he ultimately worked there for eight years and became the co-CEO. And then he decided that he wanted to leave and get involved in acquiring businesses. So Ray and Devin approached me again, asking me if I'd consider going into business with, with them in an investment business where um, Ray, Devin and I would be partners and I would be mentoring Devin, teaching him how to buy businesses. And we, Ray would be our only investor when, you know, raising your investor, you don't need other investors. And um, Devin and I worked together for three and a half years. Um, Ray let us do our own thing. I mean, he was our investor. If we, for particular investments, we passed them wow. by him, by him or the, DFO, but he let us do our own thing. And Devin and I worked together. We made a number of investments. Him and I were close, like like brothers. I mean, we sat across from each other every day. It was an unbelievable working uh, uh, learning experience. We're a trusted partner, and he was a cherished friend. And then, unfortunately, he was killed in a car accident in December oh, no. December seventeenth, twenty twenty. Yeah, um, and. Um, you know, it was uh, just devastating, oh. of course, and you know, imagine, and, and infinitely more devastating for the family than I. Um, and we ultimately decided that we were going to keep our investments, but the business was stood up for Devon, and um, so we wound down the business. Um, the family and I are still very close. I consider them extended family members. I mean, we see each yeah. other, we speak regularly, see each other at least once a year. We spend a day together in the anniversary of his accident. Um, and you know the the experience, it, tragic, horrible ending, and, and um, you never recover from that. His family, I mean, of course, never recovers. No, from I that. can only it, imagine. You know, and my my time there was unbelievable. It was incredible learning there. I mean, Ray is uh, is an incredible human being, and his late son Devin is is better than him. So, uh, you know, it, it was, um, yeah, it was a, it, it was an incredible experience with an absolutely devastating ending. Um, but you know, it's, that's these life. things happen and that's life and uh, inexplicable, but, um, you know, I was honored to be partners um, wow. with Ray and Devin and, um, that's we did some nice very things. Impressive. That's very impressive. And it tells a lot about Ray too. It's such a, um, honorable way to teach a child you know i wish i have those means to do that for my kids one day you know it's like here's an awesome mentor here's some money but you guys figure it out you know right. try to try to build your own wealth not just here's all the money that you need in order to be successful yeah well you know one of the things you know the their their whole family is like that and they're you know, it's very important if you'd meet them or spend any time with them, you would never know their net worth. They, they're, they're humble, down to earth, regular people. You know, Devin, it was, it was critical for him. His persona was he wanted to be, um, uh, you know, accountable and productive and no, e no ego. Like he was the smartest, nicest man I'd ever met in my life. Um, Devin was, I mean, I met people who were as smart and as nice, but that combination and there was no entitlement always wanted to be accountable um it was it's you know his, his parents Beautiful. did an unbelievable job because you know you, you think people used to be stunned when they meet him like you have this vision of what a the child of a billionaire is like and there's no attitude no ego i mean and his brothers are the same thing they're incredible families parents are just they're, they're just magnificent people <laughs> and honestly that tells a lot about you that you got to work and mentor with um such awesome people so um i just wanted our listeners to know that story as sure. well and i was curious when i read that briefly now we are running short on time so my last couple questions is if you were to do it all over again you can go back all the way to your paper boy <laughs> business um what would you do differently or would you do anything differently along the lessons that you learned throughout the years i don't think there's anything that, like i don't i don't have any regrets <clears throat> so nothing would stick out as saying you know oh i wish i had done this or done that there's probably the odd business you know one one particular that i might have exited too soon um but no i, I wouldn't do anything different i think life you know as a whole is infinitely more enjoyable when you have to pivot and uh, overcome some obstacles and 
you know, if you're not let in the front door, you go around to the back door. <laughs> It'd be so and boring you, if you knew yeah. exactly how things yeah. were going to play Yeah, so out. I, I, I don't, you know, on the business side, I don't have any regrets. On the personal side, I, I don't think so either. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'm by no means an angel, but maybe some things in some relationships would have uh, changed their corrected course in a did them in a more, um, you know, interacted in a more mature way, but not enough to say, oh my God, I, if I could do it all over again, here's <laughs> what I got, I've got to do. No, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy, you know, with, awesome, you know awesome. as I look back. All right. So your last words of encouragement and where can people find you? The words of encouragement, a lot of pressure here. Okay. Last, uh, no, last, last word. words of encouragement. So I, <laughs> you know, I, I believe that, you know, so many people are intrigued by this idea of entrepreneurship. I can assure them that it's doable, but until people experience it themselves, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to fathom. You think this whole idea is for rich people or for big businesses. So what I encourage people, if you have an ounce of interest in being an entrepreneur, you owe it to yourself to at least find out what's involved. I mean, you got to learn about a bunch of different things, how to go about doing this, and then decide whether or not you want to do it. Doesn't mean you have to do it, but I think to not look back and not have regrets, at least go through the exercise of determining what's involved, learn about it, and then decide. It is very doable. Anybody can do it. Not everybody will, but anybody can. So I really encourage people to, to learn about it in a good, meaningful way, and then decide. Yeah, but you do have to become the right person <laughs> yeah. in order to be a good entrepreneur. But, yeah, but you know what? How many times have you gone into a business, you meet someone successful, and you say, I can't believe these people could even tie their shoes, and yet they found, they matched their right skill with yeah. a business, they pound away every day, they You're ultimately right. become successful. For me, sometimes that's the greatest You're motivating right. factor. And so this is within the core competency of many, many, many more people than people believe. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for ending on such a positive note. If you want it, you could become an entrepreneur. That's the message of this episode. And there are awesome people and companies and programs out there to help you. Um, and where can they find you, Richard? Very easy. Go to richardparker.com. We have hundreds Beautiful. of articles and our materials and courses and free reports. So richardparker.com. Awesome. Thank you again, Richard. And thank you to our listeners for, for always tuning in. And until next time, bye. See you later. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review this podcast. Follow and engage with us on social media under the Yegi Project. And if you're interested in being a guest, email info at theyegiproject.com. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes.